Hello and good morning friends, welcome to this easy EduSet live lecture. Dear friends, taking our series forward on Indian writing in English. Today we would be talking on Tagore as a poet and for this very discussion we have once again with us in our studios Professor Anand Prakash. Professor Anand Prakash is a retired professor from Department of English, University of Delhi. Professor Prakash has immense experience and we could perceive, we could grab maximum through him because through the live EduSet lectures. He he uh, gives uh, us a um, uh, deep insight into the various topics. So let's welcome our uh, guest, Dr. Anand Prakash. Hello, sir. Welcome to the Edisit Lecture. Thank you, Geetika, <coughs> and uh, welcome viewers. And uh, today's lecture, as has been announced by uh, Ms. Geetika, is on uh, Tagore as a poet. And uh, there have been other discussions earlier, but then this is a part of the MOOCs program. And uh, I would like to relate Tagore and his work with what has been discussed under the general idea of the MOOCs program, which is uh, Indian writing in English. Uh, so the first question that emerges uh, as we consider Tagore as, a, as an Indian English poet is whether he wrote originally in English and, and, and whether he is considered one of the Indian English writers. And uh, let's think about it. Uh, Tagore was primarily a Bangla poet. He wrote in Bangla. He uh, wrote prose also in Bangla uh, at, on certain occasions. But he knew English. He had read English literature. He was exposed to the kind of uh, inspiration that came from Western uh, literature in general, and English literature in particular. And he uh, wrote essays, poems. He translated his own Bangla poems into English. Therefore, in all uh, books of history, of Indian writing in English, uh, Tagore is mentioned as a major figure. So uh, we thought that uh, uh, we can have a view of uh, Tagore as a part of uh, this literary stream uh, that is characterized as uh, Indian writing in English. Uh, apart from the language aspect, uh, Tagore belongs to a different kind of an ethos than many others uh, in the subcontinent. And uh, we have to uh, consider this aspect uh, from that point of view. Uh, as we have been you know, talking about uh, the uh, general background of culture and, and ideas in the 19th century India, uh, we have noted that uh, you know, from the uh, beginning of uh, the 19th century, uh, with the spread of English education and English thought, and uh, with you know, more and more of cultural presence uh, of the British through writing, through literature, necessitated that uh, people in India also not merely wrote, uh, merely read in uh, English, but also articulated their views and, and, and presented the, their, their emotions in English. We have a long history of this, uh, as, as, as would have been clear by now, uh, if you pursue the discussions under this program. And uh, Tagore, <coughs> in the scheme of things that we discuss, occurs in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, his uh, years are uh, 1861 to 1939, and uh, if he's born in it, um, 1861 and he reaches the century, the new century, after 39 years, then we can easily say that half of his life was spent in the uh, 19th century. And uh, the uh, beginning uh, of life of a writer in particular is shaped by pressures that are present in the formative years when the person is learning, when the person is grasping, comprehending, struggling to find out what is the uh, nature of ideas, nature of reality around him. And uh, this phase, so far as uh, Tagore is concerned, uh, was of the 19th century. Do we call him then a 19th century poet? This is a question that uh, I consider. This is a question that you also can consider. And uh, my uh, immediate answer to this question is that uh, he is and he is not. He is a 19th century poet physically, in the sense you know that he is there and he has started writing and on a big scale, and not because the ideas that he expresses remain relevant. In fact, they become more relevant uh, with the onset of the 20th century because then he is able to realize and we also see in it, you know, seeds of uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, views and concepts that would become emerge uh, that would emerge later let's say in the 1920s and 30s, uh, Tagore must have learned his lessons in the 19th century from a broader perspective 
than the lessons of other writers, as would be clear when I, when I you know, talk about Tagore as a poet. But then we have to keep in mind that Tagore has that modern sensibility, which is uh, shaped and which has been shaping uh, for, for quite some time in the 20th century too. And uh, Tagore then in that sense is a pioneer of modernity, of modernism in, in the positive sense of the word. And uh, if uh, this modernity uh, becomes uh, stronger and, and more valuable uh, with the passage of time uh, in the early years of the 20th century and from there on he takes off in a big way, then we can say that he belongs not just to the 19th century, but in fact he belongs more to the 20th century. And uh, even today, the kind of uh, things you know that he said in his lifetime are uh, you know resonating. Uh, you know, for instance, freedom that, that he talked about and the freedom that he thought of in the 19th century with respect to character, with respect to the situation, with, the, with respect to his own ideas, the voices that he captured uh, in his poetry, all that shows very clearly that uh, modernity uh, is, is a concept that, that will evolve uh, with the passage of time and will be seen in his, in, in his poems. Uh, with this uh, general you know, uh, remark about his being uh, an Indian English poet or an Indian poet, and whether he belongs to the 19th century, we move on to other general aspects, which will then help us to understand the crux of his poems. Uh, I would, uh, well, straight away call him a very, uh, you know, uh, pervasive kind of, you know, uh, presence in the 19th century. And he's there as a cultural presence. He's not merely a poet. He, he's, he's a cultural phenomenon. Uh, he, he, he's grasping things, you know, at a different level than most of us do. He writes, but writing is only the superficial part of his expression. The bigger part is that he's present as a person, as a person who interacts, as a, as a person who sees things around him uh, in, in a manner that uh, others would not be able to do. So uh, he is not merely a writer, and uh, if one has to call him a writer, then he's a writer of a different kind. So uh, I would, you know, for instance, say in the beginning itself that he's an artist and a writer to the core. And when I stay to the core, then what I mean is that he lives writing, he lives art, he, he takes art from, from, from his surroundings, he contributes something of his own, and then he makes it available for the larger audience. So what he takes, what he gives back, is a, a part of the conduct of the person as a writer. Not that he merely sits in a corner and writes, but that he sees to it that what he writes relates to the conditions of his time. And uh, he, uh, he's a 24-7 kind of a writer. He, he never ceases to be a writer. He doesn't believe in, you know, earning money and planning this and that and what we call, you know, uh, climbing uh, in society. He would not make houses. He would not invest money. He, he, would, he would not, you know, think of uh, all these things. Uh, he would not think of a job. He, he would not go around, you know, asking for some favors from somebody. He is uh, well provided. Uh, he, he comes from a you know rich, comfortably rich background uh, in the 19th century Bengal. So he is lucky that he is not to bother about the question of bread and butter. But that apart, people have enough you know in their own life, and yet they want to you know increase it, multiply it, and do nothing else. In Tagore's case, it's the other way around. If this person is born to write, he is born to think. He is born to visualize. He is he, born to imagine, and, and, and uh, for this reason, you know, we can say that he is a writer and an artist to the core. When I say that he is an artist, what do I mean? <clears throat> because a uh, writer is an artist, but art covers greater areas of uh, expression, aesthetic expression, than, than, than writing alone does. So why do I call him an artist? And uh, for the reason, you know, for instance, that he didn't uh, confine his uh, activity, his cultural role, uh, to writing, but, but he also, you know, for instance, painted. He also, you know, thought of music, and he would learn music. He would innovate. He, he would write songs. Uh, he would, you know, uh, uh, he would be a kind of musicologist. He, he knows what, what tunes are there uh, available in, in the normal, you know, round of things in the in the 19th century Bengal. So he picks up those tunes from there. He uses them for his poems, and then, you know. There is a whole tradition, as uh, you know, the people who know uh, in, in our time and uh, knew at, uh, in his time also, what is called Rabindra Sangeet. 
So there is a there is a uh, independent tradition of Rabindra Sangeet, which you know, in my view, uh, you know, is, is is a mixture of what people thought at that time at the general level. So there were you know uh, villagers who would celebrate certain occasions. And uh, on those occasions, you know, they, they would you know use certain tunes. So Tagore would go around places, or go around villages. He would pick up those tunes. He he would you know uh, fine tune them. He he would he would evolve them further, and put them into the musical mold. And then you know uh, he would uh, uh, write things which can be sung to the tunes that were originally there in the uh, common life of uh, West Bengal at the level of culture. So uh, if he's uh, painting. And, and, and if he's uh, acting, or he, if he's using theater uh, as he's doing, uh, uh, if, if, if he uh, you know, uh, sings or, or if he sees that his songs are sung, then he's a complete kind of a cultural figure in the 19th and 20th centuries. So this is what I mean when I say that he's an artist. So uh, uh, his music can be seen in his poetry, and his poetry and its flow can be seen in his paintings. So. Uh, all told, we can say that this person is living the life of the aesthetic kind, the life you know which gives you enjoyment, which, which makes you concerned about not merely your individual personal emotions, but the emotions that you know run around uh, the, the, the person, the, the, the figures, and from where you know they seep into uh, the, the mind of the sensitive writer and the sensitive artist. So is that kind of a complete figure? And uh, when we read Tagore when we talk about him, we have to keep this fact in mind. Otherwise, we would be losing out on many aspects of uh, Tagore's, you know, charismatic uh, presence and personality. Uh, uh, I have already, uh, you know, uh, talked about uh, uh, Tagore uh, being a Bangla writer, but writing also in English. And uh, if he's a translator, he's a very, you know, uh, uh, competent translator. He knows the nuances of other languages. Uh, as, as well as many, many would, would, would be you know, using in their own life. And therefore, his translations uh, you know, do not smack of translation. Uh, they don't you know, give the impression that they are translations and a uh, level apart from what the original would be. He can feel the, uh, the meaning and the emotion uh, in, in, in a poem uh, at, at a different level than others. And then he can uh, transmit it. Uh, in the language of uh, the, the uh, uh, language of translation that he chooses uh, to, to give it in. So he's primarily a Bangla writer, but he also writes in English, and that is to be kept in mind. Uh, uh, like Gitanjali was uh, 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 done by him, uh, uh, translated by him. He might have taken help from friends, which he always did. And uh, many writers, you know, take help from knowledgeable friends. But then he gives final touches. He makes the first draft. He also does the final touching, and if somebody else also can help, then he, that, that's welcome for him. So uh, that kind of a writer who writes in English because that helps him, uh, you know, communicate to a better audience. So all these things, you know, come together to make him as much uh, an, an Indian English writer as 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 he's a writer of the Bangla language. Uh, apart from poetry, he wrote, uh, you know, uh, under the uh, fold of literature, uh, you know, uh, fiction. And uh, fiction also uh, of, of great variety. Uh, he would, uh, you know, uh, write short fiction, short stories. He would write novels, longer novels. That is, he would write plays. He and uh, those plays would be staged in his time. And as, as I already mentioned, in these plays, sometimes he would be thinking of even, uh, you know, acting, uh, thinking of, you know, uh, playing a part. And uh, Tagore, uh, when, when when this person with great sensitivity uh, is there on the stage. To uh, you know, present his views, his, his uh, you know, emotions and feelings, the emotions and feelings of people, of the figures that, that he has created in his writing. When he enacts and uh, puts uh, you know, those, those feelings uh, into his own uh, sensitivity as, 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 as an actor, then you know, it must be a great experience for the audience of the time. So he writes plays. He uh, sees that they are staged, and he writes prose. And prose is uh, 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 broadly in English because there, there he has to communicate not merely to the Bangla audience but to the audience in the country as a whole and sometimes outside. Uh, if he's uh, you know having in mind, let's say the audience of India, audience of non-Bengali uh, you know uh, uh, culture and language, and if he's thinking of the world outside where English alone is effective so far as he is concerned, therefore he would be writing prose majorly in English. 
So that way he writes prose. What kind of prose? Well, uh, he can uh, you know uh, discuss culture. He can discuss contemporary political ideas like freedom, like nationalism. Uh, I'll in fact uh, uh, talk about the, the the prose part later in in, in another lecture. But so far as uh, you know, the, the variety of expressions concerned, uh, 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 one should be fully aware that uh, he had this discipline of, of writing in prose also. And uh, when I use the word discipline for prose writing, then you know I, I know that there are some specific aspects of poetry, and there are also certain uh, specific aspects of prose writing. So when you write prose, then you know certain uh, you know methods that you uh, deploy uh, in, in poetic expression also come in sometimes you know uh, uh, at, at the unconscious level and sometimes the writer also thinks you know that he has to add a different kind of dimension uh, to, to the expression uh, when one, one is writing poetry and uh, when later on he writes prose as, as I've said then those poetic things also assume certain shapes and figures so that way uh, the two things enrich each other and and, and, and they become more appealing uh, for, for the right uh, for the readers and, and for the audience of uh, both kinds of expression. Uh, <clears throat> generally speaking, uh, his uh, poetry and prose both are meant to communicate certain things, certain values, certain ideas, certain concepts, and therefore he also believes in moving around, talking, lecturing, uh, and uh, he, he goes on your know, tours and world tours, and he goes to Japan, for instance. He would go to uh, uh, to the Western world, for instance. There he would give lectures. And when he gives those lectures, then he would, uh, you know, improvise on his ideas. He would test his ideas and their authenticity. He would be uh, regularly awake, regularly alert to the influences uh, the, 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 that, you know, uh, swarm around uh, in, in the world that he inhabits. And therefore, his lecture tours give him a chance to learn more, to, to, to get the exposure better to a world which he has not seen from close quarters earlier. So he goes on those lecture tours and uh, they, they are uh, happily preserved uh, for us uh, in, in the written form. They have been published and uh, there are certain uh, lectures that you know, we use in our university, uh, in Delhi University. Uh, there is an essay by him, a longish essay, meant to be studied by students of English honors. And uh, there are references uh, to his prose writings also uh, at, at the MA level. And these things help. So we, we have, you know, uh, the lectures available in essay form, uh, in, in the printed form, and there, you know, uh, they, they communicate uh, at a level uh, that, that is direct, that is straightforward. Uh, <clears throat> so far as uh, uh, poetry is concerned, now, now let's discuss uh, some aspects of poetry here. Uh, the the po poems for which he is famous uh, in, in the world today is Gitanjali. Gitanjali, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, it's a uh, you know, book, it's, it's a collection of uh, uh, poems which are sub supposed to be sung in Bangla. So they are geets, they are lyrics, uh, they, they, they are things to be sung, they are songs. And uh, Anjali uh, would be broadly translated as bouquet. So he has a, a, a bouquet of songs uh, to offer uh, to the, to the you know, readers of uh, poetry and uh, that way uh, the songs are to be sung, the songs are to be read, songs are to be interpreted. Interpreted not merely in terms of message that occurs again and again in his songs, uh, in, 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 in the emphasis that he gives to certain ideas, but also at the level of images, at the level of symbols, because he uses symbols extensively in his songs. And uh, reading his poems, um, singing his songs, or hearing his songs sung by others, this is an experience that, that is unimaginable unless you know, one is conversant with uh, you know, the, these modes of expression. Uh, <clears throat> since he had a certain uh, musical tunes in his, in his mind while composing these songs, these songs became, songs became very famous and, and they are available today you know, uh, in, in, in the music shops and people play and they use uh, this kind of music as, as background music sometimes to evoke the Bengal uh, you know, cultural scene. Uh, of the 19th and 20th centuries, and therefore, Gitanjali was literally uh, a bouquet of songs and that he offered to the world. All, all of us know that uh, on this book he got the Nobel Prize, and uh, there were certain literary figures in the West which were involved in uh, promoting this book. Uh, W.B. Yeats, the, the great you know, uh, Irish nationalist poet uh, of English literature, uh, uh, you know, uh, met him, uh, met Tagore, 
the two remained together for some time, and then you know uh, he he saw the draft of uh, Gitanjali. He must have made certain suggestions also, as scholars now point out. And then you know uh, around the time of the First World War, uh, 1913 or 14, uh, Gitanjali was 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 awarded the Nobel Prize. Tagore was awarded the Nobel Prize for Gitanjali, and then he became uh, a world figure. In fact, a cult figure. People all over the world would be now reading him, would be discussing him, would, would become fascinated by his kind of expression, which wasn't there, let us say, uh, in, in, in the uh, 20th century Western literature. Uh, on the sides, I can tell you that uh, the uh, early years of the 20th century, so far as uh, uh, the Western literature is concerned, were, was, uh, were years of darkness, were years of uncertainty, were years of doubt and self-doubt. And uh, writers, you know, uh, who had emerged from the 19th century background, who had seen upheavals at the level of society and culture, these people became somewhat disillusioned. They were bitter, and they, 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 were, they were disappointed, and uh, they, they thought no future uh, for the world in which they lived. And uh, this, you know, showed its effect uh, on, on the writings uh, that, 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 they, that, that they gave out for the benefit of the readers then. Uh, I can give you one example of the early 20th century writing. Uh, T.S. Eliot was around. T.S. Eliot started writing in the second decade of the, of, of the 20th century. And he was writing about, well, people who have lost you know, faith in the world around them. And they have become uh, very artificial and mechanical in their manners. And their behavior is predictable. And uh, they have lost all sense of innovation. And they, they believe in, you know, they, they're just going by the, the uh, traditions that have been set by others, and because of this, they have lost uh, you know, uh, uh, grip on the on, on, on the nerve of the time. This is what uh, T. S. Eliot is doing. Most of uh, you know um, those who study English literature would have read uh, uh, Eliot's uh, love song, which is not a love song at all, which is something else. Where, where uh, uh, T. S. Eliot is bitterly talking about the absence of love in the contemporary period. And uh, then you have the wasteland, where the very idea of wasteland uh, with respect to the 20th century, uh, particularly the world uh, you know, uh, of, of the Western Hemisphere, that would tell us that those people had uh, you know, a, a different view of, of, of the world than we did here. So Tagore here is, is, is you know, uh, in, uh, in a phase of rising, in, in a phase of coming up, in a phase of welcoming changes, uh, in a phase of thinking fresh. Uh, in, in a phase of entering from the 19th century, uh, you know, uh, relative uh, stasis to the 20th century dynamism. When this is happening in India, India is, is, is agog with, uh, you know, new ideas and, 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 and with new, you know, passions. And India is, uh, you know, uh, entering, let's say, the phase of freedom, uh, the, the phase of equality, the phase of justice, the phase of struggle. The Western world, on the other hand, at that point of time, is thinking of stasis is thinking of motionlessness, uh, the, the, as if you know the, 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 they have gone completely dead and there's no future so far as they are concerned. And what they touched in the 19th century and in the early years of the 19th century is what India is witnessing in the 20th century. So uh, Tagore is uh, talking about songs and uh, T.S. Eliot at the same time, exactly at the same time, is talking about the love song, which is not a song, which is the opposite of a song, which is in fact uh, full of uh, bitterness. Uh, full of self-criticism, uh, full of, you know, uh, that uh, inner uncertainty uh, which will keep the person always irritated, annoyed, or at least, you know, disgusted. So that way, uh, you have uh, at the same time uh, two uh, facets of experience in two different parts of the world. And when Tagore goes there, then they feel, the, the, the readers and the writers of the, of the Western world, they see, uh, uh, you know, that there's a whiff of fresh air, that a new kind of experience uh, is, is given to them by a poet who has traveled all the way from the east, uh, eastern part to the western part. And that is what, you know, must have taken uh, 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 people of the western world by surprise. When Gitanjali was offered, uh, you know, uh, was given, was awarded the Nobel Prize, and then they knew that a different kind of uh, world was emerging from somewhere else. In fact, uh, all literature at the world level in the 20th century was Eurocentric. It, it, was, it was moving around uh, uh, the European experience and, and the European imagination. And when Tagore went that side, and uh, then they realized, you know, that there is a different kind of center that is emerging. 
this center is angry. This center is dissatisfied and then this, this center wants to uh, take attention, want to draw, wants to draw attention. So this freshness was there in, in Gitanjali and this must have expressed uh, you know, uh, the, the, that sense in such a way that people became uh, quite excited to, to, to see as to how to uh, react to uh, a, a different experience that they were seeing in the poems of Tagore. Uh, another point uh, that I have to mention because uh, Tagore's modernity, Tagore's sense of freedom uh, is, is also uh, combined with a, a different Indianness. I, uh, I, I do not want to use this word Indianness, but in this case uh, it is important because India had uh, uh, a, a, an ethos uh, which is called the Bhaktikal ethos. This is called the, uh, it is not a medieval period, it is the middle years of the second millennium let's say from the 12th, 13th centuries up to the 17th century, which is called the uh, period of uh, bhakti poetry, uh, po po poetry, you know, which is uh, semi-religious in nature. And uh, Tagore looked at it critically, looked at it also alertly and found that there were voices, uh, you know, in India in, in the, in, in the uh, middle centuries of, of the second millennium. And these voices were quite modern. The, the, these voices were quite down to earth. These voice, voices were not traditionally religious. They were not traditionally orthodox. Uh, they, 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 they were not circular in, in their movement. They were quite progressive. And they gave attention to those, you know, uh, experiences which belong to the lower masses. So in a way, uh, people who had not gone to the school, there were no schools in that, at that point of time, except a few uh, at, at, uh, in some uh, towns, uh, uh, large towns. So uh, people who were illiterate or semi-literate they started, you know, uh, singing things of a different kind in, in, in the Bhakti Kal. And uh, Tagore, uh, you know, um, uh, looked back uh, in the 19th century uh, to, to these uh, centuries, uh, to, for instance, uh, 15th and 16th centuries. And one poet whom he uh, specifically liked uh, at that time was Kabir. The Kabir, Kabir in India is a household name and it is now known also because Kabir is extensively translated into English. So he's also uh, popular in the elite circles in the, in the Western world. And uh, Tagore had this uh, distinction of uh, uh, introducing Kabir to, uh, you know, the Indian reader in general, uh, Indian reader in, in, in general, yes, and, and the uh, Western reader in particular. And uh, he, he was a great admirer of Kabir, and Kabir's, uh, you know, voice is, is of a different kind. Uh, it, it's, it's an individual who, who doesn't think he's an individual, who doesn't, uh, who is not to be taken as an individual, but the voice of the time. And uh, uh, Tagore saw it, and uh, very few people know today, except the scholars, that uh, Kabir was translated in a big way by uh, Tagore in the 19th century itself. And uh, it is called 100 Songs of Kabir. So imagine uh, the, the, the translation stamina of Tagore, uh, he would just pick up these songs and he would render them into English and, and, and he would make them available. And they have the kind of flow that uh, Tagore's own poetry has, which means that he has, uh, you know, uh, gained a kind of uh, uh, intimacy, poetic intimacy, imaginative intimacy uh, with Kabir and he can express ideas as if they were his own ideas, emotions and feelings as if they were his own emotions and feelings. And when you read uh, Kabir through Tagore's translation, then you don't feel that, uh, you know, it's a translation. You feel that somebody uh, with that kind of vision has already uh, given you uh, uh, a piece that is a product of his, his own imagination. So he and uh, he translated Kabir and he read Kabir and, and, and he, uh, and, and he uh, made Kabir available for discussion uh, to, to the audience at that time and later because he was <coughs> gaining a kind of uh, inspiration from Kabir. He would write like Kabir. He, he would, uh, you know, uh, think like Kabir. Uh, he, his attitude would be close to the attitude of Kabir. And what is Kabir's attitude? Kabir negates tradition. Kabir negates, you know, uh, the, the, uh, what, what is called the, uh, you know, uh, influences that, 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 that come from rituals. Uh, he will be a great critic of the rituals. And uh, that would mean, you know, that uh, uh, <coughs> Tagore's own perception would grow further uh, than, than merely a perception and would become an, an imaginative trait. So we can see a modern Kabir in the 19th century and 20th century in the form of uh, Arvindranath Tagore himself. And uh, well, uh, this, uh, this, this is a kind of forging of a sensibility which will later on, you know, uh, become 
uh, very uh, impressive and appealing uh, in, in, in English as well as in Bangla. And, and Tagore's uh, poetry uh, uh, post, you know, um, 1880 onwards, uh, around 1910 and 20. And uh, this poetry uh, th that will later on emerge, uh, this is going to appeal to a large audience and, and, and in a way different than the, the, the poetry of other uh, writers of the period. So uh, uh, <coughs> with this, I uh, uh, close the discussion and this can be further extended later. Thank you. <coughs>
And uh, after a week, after a month, after a year, after 10 years, people have changed. But then the ritual was there before. So that ritual repeated later, in fact, uh, becomes a kind of hindrance uh, to our knowing of new things that have emerged in the meantime. So uh, Kabir does such a thing again and again. He talks about caste. He, he talks about manners of people. He, he talks about their thinking ways, which were uh, you know, uh, very uh, limited. And then he says that field, ask yourself. So there is a sense of self in Kabir. And, and, and that, that, that sense of self is, is something that people don't relate to easily. And uh, 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 Tagore would have picked up the sense of self from him. What, what, what does the I mean? And who is this I? Is this I a part of uh, some bigger phenomena in life? Is it, a, is it the I of God, for instance? So Kabir has his own view of God. He doesn't believe in the accepted notion of God. But then there is something uh, you know, beyond one, one's own self. And uh, that something is impinging on the self, is, is compelling the self to examine and re-examine. And that's what you know, Kabir does at the level of imagination. And uh, this thing is picked up by Tagore in his own poetry. So uh, mysticism is there in, uh, in Kabir. It is also there in Tagore. It has been there in all the bhakti poets of the, of the middle uh, centuries of the millennium, second millennium. And uh, it is something that drives you know, the, the poetic movement forward. So mysticism is that kind of a thing, and you will see uh, mysticism in, in the poetry of 9th century, great 9th century uh, Indian poets. You will see uh, mystics also in the 20th century, and they will always remain in some form or the other. And uh, uh, Tagore then has that mystical in, uh, inclination. The good thing about mysticism is that uh, uh, it, it, it uh, always makes the person modest. That tells the uh, uh, poet again and again that one should know that one doesn't know many things. So when, when one is aware of one's own uh, lack of knowledge, then one cannot be assertive. So uh, a mystic is not assertive. A mystic, mystic generally is evocative. And uh, we see that uh, when Tagore writes his songs, and when he writes his longer poems, then he's, uh, he, he's giving the impression that he's a student. He, he, he's a person who's studying the, the, the phenomena around him. He's commenting, but his comments are open-ended. He is assessing, but his assessments are incomplete. So that sense of modesty, that, that sense of self-criticism, it is that you know which lends freshness to poetic expression. And this uh, freshness of poetic expression actually is the result of what I call, in this limited context, mysticism. So uh, <clears throat> he has this uh, uh, reading of Kabir uh, made Tagore uh, wider in range. What does Kabir talk about? Kabir talks about the whole world. Kabir talks about the clouds. Kabir talk, uh, talks about love. Uh, Kabir talks about the essence of religion, not not religion, uh, no, not or not rituals, but the essence of religion. If uh, God is to be called by different names, Kabir would discard the idea of God, and he would simply say name. And uh, there are great uh, poets, you know, of of the same period like Guru Nanak, and uh, he would just say Nam, name. So they, they don't even want to uh, identify certain gods as gods. So uh, for, for, these, for these great you know, bhakti poets, uh, God was a name. And so why, why call God by, by the name of God, but call by, by the name? So anybody can, can, can name anything, and that name is important. What does the name signify? Uh, uh, this, this should be interesting you know, to go into the <coughs> significance of the name. The name means that you have to call something arbitrarily. So if you call something arbitrarily, without uh, you just give a, a voice pattern, and they say this is what it is, then it's the name. So it is something that is nameless is given a name so that it can be identified. And uh, that's, that's the great perception of the Bhakti poets. And uh, Tagore also would not like to talk about religion the way people understand it. But he would see the essence of religion all around him. So where is God in, in our life? Where does he reside? Does he, does, he, does he reside in the four walls of a temple or a mosque? A good question. And, and Tagore would say nothing to him. This is not the case. And this is what straight away takes him back to the, the ideas of Kabir. So what I'm saying is that uh, range of and, and the depth of uh, 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 perception uh, that, that, that we see in the poetry of Tagore is that which you know demarcates him as, 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 as a figure which is difficult to match in the, in the 19th century and in the 20th century. And uh, he because, because of his intensity and because of his heightened imagination, uh, it's not the ordinary imagination, it's a heightened imagination. Because of that, 
he is able to appeal through the town to the, to the village, village audience and he can also appeal to people of a different epoch. So, th this is what is called the range. He talks in such a manner that it, it does not, whatever he says is not topical, it is not immediate, it is not of immediate interest, but something that will relate, that will help people relate to it much better, much, much stronger maybe in the other uh, you know areas of life and in the other areas of history. So, this is what you know is the range and depth that, that, that Tagore has uh, in the 19th century and the early 20th century and it is that range which he has taken from uh, the, the, the uh, voices of, uh, of, 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 the, of the previous era uh, in India as well as from voices that come from the west. Uh, Tagore uh, would not uh, shun you know take influence from anywhere. If you find something valuable uh, in, in one language or another language in India or outside, then he will simply accept it on his own terms, but he will accept it. So, that kind of open mindedness and you know uh, generosity to, to give and, 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 and the urge to take uh, from, from anywhere one likes that expands his scope and that, that makes him uh, a, a, a poet of, of a range uh, you know which, which is not easily achievable. So, uh, Inspiration from the, the uh, poets uh, uh, who belong to an early epoch in India is, is, is something that gave range and scope uh, to, to Tagore in the 19th century. And uh, 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 then of course, uh, he translated Kabir. And uh, now let us go into certain emphases of uh, you know, Tagore in his poetry. These emphases are important. What is he talking about? Uh, all of us would like to know as to what uh, is Tagore famous for in his poetry. How is his poetry different from the poems written by other people in his own time and later? These are the questions you know that we should be discussing uh, when we uh, take up the, the question of poetic expression in the case of this poet or that poet, one poet or another. So, I will just talk in general about these emphases and uh, you can uh, trace them. Uh, the, the influences of, of, of these emphases, the presence of these emphases in his poems when you, when you study them uh, in, in your uh, various courses. Uh, one very important emphasis in uh, Tagore's poetry uh, is, you know, uh, nature. So, he is not talking about society. Society is uh, that way mundane. Uh, it, it refers to, uh, you know, pressures of life that exist at a particular time. And maybe you, you never move out of your neighborhood if you are always talking about topicality. You will not uh, move uh, beyond, you know, your, your, your town, uh, beyond your city if you are talking only about politics. So, therefore, nature takes you away from these things and joins you with uh, aspects of nature elsewhere. And uh, all of us, you know, at some point or the, or, or the other look at nature as, 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 uh, the, as an inspiring force. And uh, Tagore does it again and again. He is fascinated by the, the, the logic of nature, if there is any logic in nature. Uh, if there is no logic in nature as say, uh, as, uh, per se, then he, 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 would, he would defy the presence of logic in his own surroundings. And he would say, be like nat nature, be, be, be as, as, as natural as nature is. And uh, society is too much bound by principles and ideas. So, that way, his uh, adherence to nature will help him criticize his own society. Because society is logical and nature is not that, that way logical. So, anyway, the, the absence of logic or the, the presence of a different kind of logic in nature that enables him to look alertly at the phenomena around him. So, uh, nature does this kind of a thing. Which aspects of nature uh, does he talk about? Clouds. Uh, clouds are all the subject of study for, for, for people of science and uh, these days, you know, we, we predict uh, our weather, uh, you know, weather reports, you know, carry uh, behind them, uh, you know, great work. Done by, done by machines, done, done by scientists. But then, clouds are a different experience. You look at the clouds, you look at the cloud formation, you look at the colors, you look at the shades of clouds, you, 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 uh, you know, look at the heaviness of clouds that will finally become rain and start, you know, drenching us. So, these, uh, you know, things that are associated with the clouds, they are taken as also sources of enjoyment sources of pleasure by, by, by uh, uh, Tagore and he looks at uh, the clouds, their formation and he, and he fi is filled with surprise, he is filled with power, he is filled with excitement and that excitement then is captured through his poetic words. So, uh, uh, a love object is what a cloud is so far as uh, Tagore is concerned. 
uh, the same kind of uh, 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 emotion uh, will be there uh, in his poetry when he looks at the sea. The sea is endlessly moving this way and that. The, the, the sea has waves, you know, which go very high and then they crash against the ground. And this crashing of the, of the waves and this going up and, and this flow, you know, that is there of water of a different kind, uh, the, the form that is created on the surface of the water, these things are an experience which can only be uh, enjoyed, you know, when you go to the sea and when you uh, uh, imaginatively merge with the sea. And uh, the, this uh, impact of uh, water in movement, uh, in impact of water uh, and so much of massive water, uh, you know, seas are uh, three times more than the, the uh, land uh, area uh, in, in, uh, in, on, on the earth. And therefore, when you look at the sea, then you have that endlessness in mind. And that endlessness in mind uh, that, that, that you have has come from the, the, the actual reality that is in front of you where you can't really uh, go to the end of it. Rivers, rivers never stay, they always move on. That's a new experience. Sea is circular that way. But so far as rivers are concerned, you start from somewhere, you are going somewhere. So you have uh, uh, one phase and you have another phase. You have one area and then you have another area. And uh, the, the previous area supplies, the, the latter area supplies to the next one. So see, uh, th th there is a kind of a chain and the chain is moving forward. So who knows? Some poets, like, like some scientists, can think of, uh, you know, uh, movement in a certain direction. And if the direction is good, then they would say, okay, let's move in that direction. So the sense of direction that is there, it, that's the philosophical idea. That you know, things start from one place and then go to another, and that thing is more or less fixed. So if that is, that is fixed, should we go in that direction? Well, the good philosophical question. And uh, it is the rivers which, you know, create in us, in our minds, uh, the concept of direction and the concept of movement, which may not be there in, in the same way so when, when you look at the sea, because the sea is there, there are movements there, but then they don't go in a certain direction. Uh, the, suddenly they, they, they come back. But as far as rivers are concerned, sometimes the river goes for thousands of miles and only in one direction. So maybe one starts thinking then that life can also be moving in a certain direction for the better. Then you have birds. What is the uh, common point between birds and human beings? For, for, for Kabir, they are forms of life. Uh, uh, and you, when you look at the birds, they don't think that they are, they are backward. You, you think, you know, that, that, that they, are, they have certain uh, lessons to give to us. You look at a bird and see its movement. It is so very fluent. You look at the colors of the birds. You, you look at the, 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 the sounds of the birds. And certain sounds are very close to human sounds. And, and may, maybe even, even voice. Maybe, maybe there is a kind of a pattern there. And uh, the, the singing of birds is an experience of a different kind. Human beings may have learned certain aspects of singing from the birds. And when you look at the birds, then you get, get into that poetic mode where you are filled with amazement. So birds, you know, are, are become a, a, a figure that, that gives us a sense of amazement. Seasons. A season has its own nature. A, a season has its own arithmetic. A season begins at, at, at some point, ends at some point. It has symptoms and signs which are not there in other, other, other phenomena. So you look at the seasons, and, and Tagore will talk about these seasons. He, he, he will, you know, put the, the, the seasons and their music into the, in, into the, uh, you know, uh, compositions, in, into the lyrics, into the songs that he writes. And uh, do uh, seasons tell us something? Well, seasons move on and seasons come back. So they are circular as well as onward. That's a, that, that's a new kind of uh, principle of maybe physics. You know, that things are moving and, and, and they are coming back and that they move forward and they, they are circular. The earth, what does earth signify? The earth, it's, it's, a, it's a whole topic. Now, I, I'm not going into the, the science of the subject, but I'm going into the perception of the subject. What is earth for us? In our case, in our cultural history, the earth is supposed to be like our mother. It sustains us. Uh, it, it, it is fertile. Uh, it, it, give, it, it gives us you know, uh, stability. It gives us security. Uh, it helps us, you know, grow things. So, see, so many qualities are there in the earth. Now, these are available to the scientists and to the people who believe in productivity. What about the poet? Tagore would be filled up with a certain idea when he looks at the earth. There is a whole poem by him. Uh, the poem would be about six pages. Uh, it's a long poem and he's uh, using very big uh, symbols, 
uh, you know, uh, which are not merely pervasive, but all encompassing. And when you look at the <coughs> Earth from that angle, and Earth is emerging somewhere at, uh, in, in, in the cosmos, then you know, uh, a person like Tagore can, you, uh, can capture the, the, the very emergence of the Earth in that bigger uh, you know, scheme uh, that, that, that you would see. And if he can't understand it, then as I have said earlier, he will be talking like a mystic. He, he, he is happy that things are happening this way. <clears throat> and he, even if he doesn't know, he knows that this is the occasion to celebrate and to sing about. In the sky, <coughs> uh, uh, that Tagore would, would talk about the sky, about its loneliness, about, about the music, the, 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 the strange kind of music that, that may be there in the sky. And the uh, sky is that, you know, uh, we can call it vacuum, we can call it whatever we like, but this is the most expanded uh, thing of vision, uh, uh, thing in front of us. And uh, all that we see is a part of the sky. And uh, if, if we see it this way, then some people imagine God to be such, <coughs> some people imagine imagination to be such. Human imagination is as big as the sky because it takes uh, into its hold all that we see and so on and so forth. So these are, these are the aspects of nature. And uh, Tagore, uh, in his characteristic uh, uh, gravity, uh, characteristic depth, characteristic expanse, he talks about these different areas of nature. The second uh, emphasis, first is nature. The second emphasis that he's talk about, he talks about the child. A grown-up person, a person with so much of knowledge, a person with so much of literacy, so much of information, so much of achievement in life, talks about the child who doesn't have any of these things. Why so? Think about it. What is there uh, which is precious in the child? Uh, before uh, Tagore in India, uh, in, in, in England, uh, was this poet called Wordsworth, William Wordsworth, and he talked about the child, and he called him the best philosopher. Maybe Tagore also shares this, this with Wordsworth. Child is the best philosopher. In what way? If you ask this question, then Tagore would not straight away answer, but Tagore would answer it in his poetry. He would, he would say something about the child, and that will, you know, make us think about the, uh, you know, essence of uh, truth. The, 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 the essence of uh, something appealing uh, that, that is hidden behind, that is hidden within the existence of a person as a child. So, a uh, child can be a big phenomenon. In fact, there, there are poets who gave all their, uh, you know, uh, poetic, uh, you know, uh, might, uh, their, their imaginative depth to the depiction of the child. We have in India such poets, you know, in the 16th, 17th centuries. We have, for instance, that great poet called Mahatma Surdas. He would talk all his life about the truth and reality of the child in God, and his God is Lord Krishna. So he is visualizing Lord Krishna as a child. So just see that you know people have given all their life to the depiction of childhood, and Tagore must have uh, you know taken uh, appeal and inspiration for 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 this theme from uh, poets in India and from poets elsewhere, the Romantic poets in particular, the Wordsworth, whose name I mentioned. The uh, <coughs> aspect of a uh, child's perception. Uh, the, the, that has moved poets and that, that, that has moved uh, Tagore in particular is innocence. A child is, uh, doesn't question, a, a, a child doesn't, uh, you know, doubt, a child uh, doesn't stay and say, uh, well, I, I don't agree. The, the child is, is very innocent. You tell the child uh, your view and the child would accept it and the child would happily accept it. The child would not have that kind of ego. Uh, we, we, which, which uh, visits us so much and uh, remains with us all the time that, you know, we uh, keep our eyes closed to uh, the, the worth of people, the, the value of people around us. The child would not be, uh, you know, uh, uh, stopped by uh, this kind of an ego and the child would accept as things come in front of, uh, in front of him or her. So if the child can do this, why can't we? In fact, the child has much of nature in him or her. The, child, uh, the uh, childhood is a, a natural phase. It's the beginning of life. And beginning of life in human beings or beginning of childhood elsewhere, beginning of uh, the childhood maybe in birds, may, maybe in animals. So all these uh, you know, people become together in the imagination of the poet. And that is what Tagore is trying to capture in his poetry. Innocence. The second is playfulness. The child wants to play with everything. The child doesn't you know, try to separate knowledge from all these things. The child is curious. And that curiosity uh, is, is satisfied when the, the child starts playing 
And uh, in the course of playing, uh, the, the child would uh, get into a different mold of, uh, let, let's say, uh, uh, movement, uh, the, the, um, running around, getting new rhythms uh, in, 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 in the middle of, of, of his uh, actions. And uh, then, you know, the, uh, there will be a depth uh, which is not easy to, to behold in, in the case of the child, but there can be depth there because, of the, uh, as I have already uh, you know, referred to, uh, the, the commonality of the child with, uh, in, in, in human beings with uh, other species, with, with animals, with birds, and even you know, a young plant is, is like a child, uh, a sapling is like a child. Then you know the child is ever curious, unlike us, we are not ever curious, it's only some of us are curious. Poets are mostly curious, but a person who has known a little, this person will say, I know about it, I am not interested in what you are saying. The uh, child will not say this. The child doesn't have that sense of limiting eye, which is there in uh, supposedly uh, adults, uh, ad adult people, and uh, you know people who, who, who know a bit more than others. And then, lastly, but, but most importantly, the child experiments. The child wants to break things into, uh, in, into pieces and they put the pieces again uh, together. This, this is the regular you know, play, uh, play of, the, of, of the children. And uh, that, in fact, shows that human beings, if they have to retain their humanity, then they should learn this lesson from children that they will experiment. Then you have, in, 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 in Tagore, you have harmony, you have music, you have emotions, you have passions. And these emotions and passions are, 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 in, in, are uh, exclusive to human beings. Human beings can you know, retain passions and emotions for a long period. They, they, they can give names to these passions. They, 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 and with these names and their descriptions, they can recreate these passions. In literature, what happens is that if the, if the passions have been stored, if the passions have been you know, uh, uh, framed in, uh, in, in, a, in, in a literary piece, then as soon as you read a literary, literary uh, piece, you enter that realm of the passion again, the second time, the third time. So, uh, <coughs> Uh, still another uh, emphasis uh, in, in Tagore's poetry is the village. The, the village which is a kind of, let's say, a child of society. Uh, a, a, a society in childhood perhaps is the village, or maybe uh, even before that. Before the village you have uh, the forest. Uh, the village signifies hard work, productivity, you have agriculture, and the people uh, involved in agriculture would always remain fresh, would always be happy, they, they sing songs of a different kind. Tagore talks about women. <coughs> Young women, they talk of love, they talk of longing. And uh, now that I have uh, uh, told you about uh, these different aspects, <coughs> let me read out uh, uh, a few lines from Tagore's poetry uh, to, to tell you <coughs> as to what I mean when I talk in general about the aspects of Tagore's poetry. Uh, <coughs> Tagore is uh, giving a kind of anger, is giving a kind of uh, disillusionment with the mechanical nature of society. And this is the point that, that, that I'm reading from Gitanjali. <coughs> he says to somebody who has gone to a temple uh, to, to, to worship God, and he says, leave the chanting and singing and telling of beads. Whom dost thou worship in this lonely dark corner of a temple with doors all shut? A temple's doors are shut. You go inside and, 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 you, and you, you, are, you, are, you are worshiping something. And then Tagore says, he is there. God is there where the tiller is tilling, the hard ground and where the path maker is breaking stones. Where is God? Not in the temple. God is there in the fields. God is, taken on, on, uh, is there on the road where, where, where uh, the path maker is breaking stones. He is with them in sun and in shower and his garment is covered with dust. So don't, don't think that uh, God likes uh, clean people. God likes people who are working, who are covered with dust. Put off thy holy mantle, and even like him, come down on the dusty soil. So if you come on the dusty soil, if you come to the earth and, and, and to the normal ways, then only you can appreciate the presence of God. The other poem that I, I uh, talk about is this. The sky is overcast with clouds, and the rain is ceaseless. It's a picture. He's not saying much. He's simply saying, see the sky, it's overcast with clouds, and rain is ceaseless. I know not what this is that stirs in me. He can't explain, doesn't know it. I know not its meaning, how simple and how modest. He's just simply enjoying, he doesn't know what it is. 
a moment's flash of light lightning drags down a deeper gloom on my sight. He's feeling sad all of a sudden, without knowing why. And my heart gropes for the path where the music of the night calls me. The music of the night calls me. Why the music of night? Why does it call him? He doesn't answer. He has not to answer, because that's a state of mind. And uh, the poet, you know, captures the state of mind. And after that, the, po uh, the poet does not say as to what exactly the state is. He has told it. He has shared it with us. And after that, it is for us to imagine as to what was it like. How did it feel? And uh, the last thing, light. Oh, where is the light? Kindle it with the burning fire of desire. Most of the people who are given to morality and, and, and uh, you know, life of, of principle cannot talk like this. But this person is telling us, like a true human being, that there are desires in him and these desires will kindle and, and, and make light for itself. A different kind of an experience from a poet who wants to tell us that we should accept desire as, desires as real, not as wrong or right. And if somebody accepts desires as real, then, of course, one is a different kind of human being. So you have in Tagore all these emphases, which I have uh, talked about, uh, spread over his poetry, his poetic expressions. And you know, uh, these, these, these expressions uh, ask questions, raise certain questions. They, they, they make us wonder. They, they, they fill us with amazement. They, 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 they give us a sense of, sense of ecstasy. And uh, when we have gone through Tagore's poetry and poetry like that of Tagore elsewhere, then we become what can be called transformed human beings. So that's the purpose of poetry. And Tagore is a first-rate poet uh, of the subcontinent. And he'll remain a uh, subject of inspiration for a very long time to come. And uh, therefore, I would say that read Tagore, enjoy him, try to learn from him, and try to interpret him in your own way. Thank you. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much. And dear friends, if you want to give your feedback for this particular lecture, then you can mail us at info.cc at the rate of in. And yes, of course, we will be meeting again soon. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again.